Hello, I'm Hilary, and as we start this week, David is on the brink of becoming the king of Israel. But we get to ease in with a few Psalms. So day one, Psalms 81, 88, 92, 93. And what stood out to me first was Asaph's word in Psalm 81. He's starting with praise and celebrating how God has set things up for them. And like Moses and others before him, he remembers the slavery and the rescue from Egypt. But this little sentence indicates a shift from words spoken to God to words spoken from God. I heard an unknown voice say, it's a thus saith the Lord moment. You know, God is speaking afresh over them. God is reminding them, now I will take the load from your shoulders. I will free your hands from heavy tasks. You cried to me in trouble and I saved you. And it is God warning them again, reminding them really about the mountain of blessing, that it's still a reality. And what stood out to me the most was God's heart for them. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my paths. How quickly I would subdue their enemies. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it with good things. Moving on, I read Heman's Psalm 88, The Suffering of Affliction, almost like a contrast to Psalm 93. And then I realised that the same thing was standing out to me. Both authors are experiencing a distance from God. And it is a truth that the Lord is King and he's robed in majesty, that God is the everlasting past, mightier than the violent raging of the seas, mightier than the breakers on the shore, that the Lord is above. He's mightier than all of these, that God is holy and he alone reigns forever. And these are the big truths about God. But if we only hold these truths and not the many ones that he gives us about his close proximity, then I think the scales are weighted so that we find it hard to see truth in our difficulties. And I think that's what we see in him and Sam a bit. Unlike other Psalms on suffering, there's not a journey towards revelation through remembering. And yet it does reflect part of the journey, the part where you feel overwhelmed and alone and hopeless because hope is yet to be remembered and revealed. So if we see the message of this song as a complete narrative, then at best it serves to remind us to keep the scales balanced. If we only see God on his throne, judge over all the earth and ruler of the seas, it's easy to see how someone, perhaps him and himself, could feel like God's anger weighs them down with wave after wave that God has somehow engulfed them. Or that because there's so great a distance between them that it would be easy or reasonable to think that God has forgotten you or that he can't hear you. Oh God, why do you reject me? Why do you turn your face from me? Psalm 143 is an example of a balanced scale in our suffering. Come quickly, Lord, and answer me for my depression deepens. Don't turn away from me or I will die. Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning for I am trusting you. Show me where to walk for I give myself to you because of your faithfulness. Bring me out of this distress. So within the same nature of God that is high and lifted up and holy and majestic is God whose love is new for us each morning, who walks with us and is faithful, whose gracious spirit leads us forward on firm footing. A song that I'm listening to today fits with this message well. It's called Fourth Man by Jonathan David Hessler. I'll put a little link in. It says, you are above it all, but you stand here. Fourth man in the fire, conquering my fears. You are above it all, but you draw near, walking on the water. I will meet you here. I will meet you here. It's beautiful. 
Psalm 92 is the fourth book of the Psalms and it's one I know well because I used it in my wee book called Digging Up the Sabbath. And I'm a great advocate for a real Sabbath, not the false religious ones used to control people, but the life-giving one that Jesus said he is Lord of. This psalm is a great starting point for your day off as part of the process of just laying down labour and work and picking up rest and play. And it starts with thankfulness. It's good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare that loving kindness in the morning and to take time to look back at the good things. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the work of your hands. O Lord, how great are your works. And also to look for God's wisdom, both in in what has been and also in what is coming up. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know them, nor a fool understand them. Those deep thoughts of God. And creativity helps this whole process, as we've seen with the other Psalms. Here he is using music, but other creative processes work really well too. Here it says, on an instrument of ten strings, or the lute, or the harp, with harmonious sound. And the whole process leads to perspective including perspective on the enemies in our lives. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies, many of which for us are in our heads. The promise of Sabbath rest has always been amazing. It's a fascinating subject, plug plug. Take a look at these truths. You have made me as strong as a wild ox. You have anointed me with the finest oil. The godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. They are transplanted into the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of God. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. And that sounds good to me. Okay, we're going back to Chronicles. It's day two and first Chronicles seven to 10. And as you trawl through Chronicles, there are these little gem moments that you can miss if you're prone to speed read like me. I caught Ephraim had a daughter named Shira, and she built the towns of Lower and Upper Beth Haran and Ez and Shira. It's a rare record, a woman doing something that's just usually attributed to men. And it made me wonder if the recording is rare of women doing stuff or the action is. And while the timelines shift about a bit because Chronicles was written a long time after this point, the testimony of the gatekeepers kind of stood out to me. Something of the importance of not just keeping a record, but of referring to that record. We could say it's just about enabling the Jewish system to function by ensuring that all of this Levitical lineage is written down, for instance. But I think it sends a message to remember those who have been before, who served, who were faithful and played their part in what is now our story. I have heard teaching, I'm sure you have too, where the speaker has really been moved by God to remember the work of someone before them. And there's lots of books, of course, where someone's been led to highlight a story of someone in the past or a revival or a testimony of their own suffering and faith. I mean, Corrie Ten Boom's The Hiding Place comes to mind. There's a book everyone should read. The picture of the community of the gatekeepers, the family that they were, that the gatekeepers were stationed on all four sides, that the relatives in the villages came regularly to share their duties for seven days, that the four chief gatekeepers, all Levites, were trusted officials and they would spend the night around the house of God since it was their duty there to guard it and then they would open the gates every morning. Chapter 10 starts the parallel accounts with our readings in the book of Samuel and it's interesting to see where they've summarised what was a much more detailed account um, it can kind of warp the understanding if we're not careful. For instance, we know that Saul failed to obey the Lord's command to wait for Samuel before going into battle. But Chronicles says Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He failed to obey the Lord's command and he even consulted with a medium instead of asking the Lord 
for guidance. And it could easily be read that Saul's moment of disobedience is something about the medium, which of course didn't happen until much, much later. And this just makes me sit up and take note and perhaps there are a lot more details between the books that we will need to kind of merge together and bring clarity to. So we're back in the Psalms, it's day three, Psalms 102 to 104. And the authors of today's Psalms are in the unknown category, and of course the timing is not agreed on either. Psalm 102, it reads like prophecy in lots of ways. Whether they get there through their journey of troubles and crying out to God, or the whole thing is written from a future perspective, as if they are someone speaking from that point in history in the, in the exile that hasn't happened yet. It says, you will arise and have mercy on Jerusalem. And now is the time to pity her. Now is the time you promise to help. And for the Lord will rebuild Jerusalem. He will appear in his glory. He will listen to the prayers of the destitute. He will not reject their pleas. The reason I think I wonder if it is prophetic rather than being written during the exile is this little sentence. Let this be recorded for future generations so that a people not yet born will praise the Lord. And it seems like he is saying this is a word for people not yet born. So when the trouble hits, they will know what to do. and They'll stick with God. But today what stood out the most was the possible symbolic language in Psalm 102. It's this bit. Long ago you laid the foundation of the earth and you made the heavens with your hands. They will perish but you will remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing but you will change them like a garment and discard them. But you are always the same. You will live forever. Now, is this prophetically declaring how the world will end or is the earth and the heavens symbols used to mean something else? Is it literal? Is it symbolic? Is it perhaps a kind of exaggerated language in order to provide a contrast? And this argument is around something called eschatology, essentially exit theology. How is it all going to end? And it's something that's going to crop up again and again as we go through scripture. And we certainly aren't going to reach a conclusion from this one verse alone. There's a reason that I'm calling it an argument. But we make a start with this particular passage, drawing on a few cross references as we go along. These verses in Psalm 102 are actually quoted in the book of Hebrews chapter one as something that God the Father will say to the Son. The context is that the Son is a creator and is eternal as God himself is. And the created is temporal and therefore not God. This concept of heavens and earth disappearing will be raised by God through the prophet Isaiah. He says, look up to the skies above and gaze down on the earth below, for the skies will disappear like smoke and the earth will wear out like a piece of clothing in Isaiah 51. And this is the same context as the passage when it's quoted in Hebrews about Jesus. In fact, God clarifies that in this instance, he is talking about the temporal nature of the created versus the eternal nature of God, saying the people of the earth will die like flies, but my salvation lasts forever. My righteousness will rule and it will never end. So there's a truth in a literal application here. The earth is indeed wearing out and so are people. And the language of the passage is providing that contrast with the eternal, God who will never wear out. And I think that's what the author of Hebrews was probably doing when he used our passage in Psalm 102, lifting it out of its context and using it as language that provided a classic compare and contrast moment for his argument that Jesus is eternal, the son of God. Now, Psalm 103 also uses this kind of contrast to make a similar point. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildflower. We boom, 
we boom, we bloom and then we die. The wind blows and we are gone as though we had never been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever. See the contrast. But what about our context in Psalm 102, the one before it? Interestingly, when we look at the setting of a Jerusalem that needs restored, then its context is a time in the future when God is going to act, he's going to restore it. In this case, Isaiah also speaks of a time during which Jerusalem was waiting to be restored, waiting for God's justice. He prophesied that the heavens above will melt away and disappear like a rolled up scroll and the stars will fall from the sky like withered leaves from a grapevine in Isaiah 34. And its timeline is the destruction of the Edomites by the Babylonians. After they have rejected God and they help to destroy the temple in Jerusalem and they go to the dark side. So Isaiah, who is writing in 740 to 701 BC with time, you know, going up to zero, is talking of a time in the future, in the 6th century BC. So it's a prophecy that's been fulfilled. And yet the earth and the heavens were still standing and the stars were still in the sky. And what this tells us is that in this instance, the heavens and the stars represent something. They are symbolic. And I remembered when God was talking to Abraham, he used the stars to symbolise people, the descendants that Abraham would have. So in Isaiah's context, they are thought to, they could represent people with power and how they will be brought down, they will be destroyed. The concept under scrutiny and taking up much of the word count today is also raised by the sun, not just about the sun, in Matthew 25. And he says that the heaven and earth will disappear. And he's talking about a time that is coming a time that they all needed to be practically ready for, ready to flee. And he gives them indications of what will happen just before this, that these signs that you'll know this is about to happen. And he uses descriptions that are relevant to the culture that they are living in then. And he uses similar language to Isaiah when he's talking about judgment, a destruction of something. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And there's a key statement that Jesus makes in the middle of it all. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene, from the world, until these things take place. Now this indicates that if all of this was about the end of the world, the last coming of Jesus, if it was all literal language, then it would have happened in the next 40 years from which when he spoke it. Because the term a generation was always used to describe 40 years. Now, what did happen after 40 years after Jesus speaks this is the invasion of Jerusalem, the destruction of another temple and the whole of the Jewish system, the old covenant. The Christians at that time had very little warning, but they made it out because they knew what to look for, those culturally relevant practical details. So my general thinking here is, and I stress it's my thinking because you will have your own thoughts, is that Jesus used the terms heaven and stars and earth as symbols for the power and the people of the old system and the old covenant. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a final judgment or a final coming of the Son of God in glory. I believe that there is. It's a meaty subject and it was a breath of fresh air to move into Psalms 103 and 104 like a cool swim after staying a little bit too long in the hot sun. So day four, First Chronicles um, 11 and 12 and 2 Samuel 5 which start, then all Israel gathered before David at Hebron and told him, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, when Saul was king, you were the one who really led the forces of Israel. And the Lord your God told you, you will be my shepherd of my people, Israel. You will be the leader of my people. So there at Hebron, David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel 
and the anointed him king of Israel, just as the Lord had promised through Samuel. So what stood out were the added details, the enriching of the story. For instance, Second Samuel adds that David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned for 40 years in all. Or when David orders the attack to get the Jebusites out of Jerusalem. This time it's Chronicles that adds the detail that whoever is first to attack the Jebusites will become commander of the armies and Joab, the son of David's sister, Zeruah, was the first to attack. And in fact, David's nephew, Joab, will also be someone who rebuilds the rest of Jerusalem with him. And Chronicles chooses to detail David's mighty men at this point. The book of Samuel is going to do that later on but looking at the reading for that day it's got a load of psalms in it so let's just talk about them now. What stood out to me was something about the structure of the group. Like how Jesus did with his followers we see David has an inner circle and then a wider group and David also has an overall kind of leader designated to help him lead and the inner circle of three are as passionate about David and as faithful to him as they see David being to God, they're being led by his example. It's another nephew of David's who has led this larger group of 30 men. And it's not just that these men are exceptional warriors, but they have taught David what it's like to lead people who are faithful. They've set the bar. And as the group grows in number, David grows in his ability to lead and to delegate over time. And we've got the men and their families following David and that group grows massively until it's like a great army, like the army of God, it says. And I love the detail that they come to Hebron in battle array with the single purpose of making David king over Israel. Enough's enough. It's time. And they're ready for trouble. But when there is no trouble, they're ready to celebrate with him. And I'm reminded that when God calls us to something, it doesn't mean that we are ready for it or will even be ready in the next 10 years. In many ways, a calling moment is just a heads up to why the difficult things are happening or when they happen and how God is going to use them to get you ready for that calling. People just often want to rush things, myself included. Many years from now, God will say to another person who's got a big calling in their future to not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin and also encourages that person. It's not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. You know, in this first eight months of mustard seed thinking being public, it's just been that, a tiny seed, a small plant that can hold a few birds at a time. But I'm happy about that. It's just the way it should be because I have so much to learn. So day five, we're in Second Samuel and we've got Psalms 133, 107 and kind of 106. David has defeated the Philistines. And we see that simple back and forth conversation between God and and David happening. Simple instructions faithfully followed. But what stood out to me was as soon as they are dealt with, the Philistines, David's priority is to bring back the Ark of God. It's a moment of celebration, but they forget about the high speed holiness train. They are essentially having a party on the platform, ignoring the yellow safety line and dancing dangerously close to the edge of the platform. And they do have the records of the history and the way in which they are to bring the ark, how it was moved, what went wrong if they didn't do it right and they weren't careful and who was meant to be doing it. I think this is possibly the first time that we see David have a bit of a fallout with God, a bit of a flump as we call it in Britain. David was angry because of the Lord's anger. The result of this is like a little temporary separation in David's response. He doesn't go back to God and ask him what to do. It says he is afraid of God And he makes a bit of an independent decision based on a fear to move the ark. So he just moves it somewhere else. 
temporarily party over. It's a bit of a time out for David. Now the parallel reading in 1 Chronicles 13 tells us that the second time that David moves the ark, he carefully considers it. He's learned his lesson. No one except the Levites may carry the ark of God. That because you Levites didn't carry it the first time, that's why the anger of the Lord our God burst out against him because we failed to ask how to move it properly and that's the lesson that he is learning here he didn't have the conversation with the Lord which he could have had what he now sees is that God wasn't trying to catch them out and be difficult but with the right plan in place with their obedience God clearly helped the Levites as they now carry the ark it wasn't that it needed to be some kind of solemn atmosphere that it was moved in, it's that it needed to be moved by the Levites. There's so much more that stood out to me in this story, but we're going to revisit that next week anyway in First Chronicles, so we'll move into our Psalms for today. And when I set out to create a reading plan, I couldn't find an existing chronological plan for the Old Testament in a year, and I'm a good researcher. So I had to use the timeline from a whole Bible in a year and kind of spread out the Old Testament. So it it isn't perfect. And as we will read, Psalm 106 will actually be better placed next week because it is also in First Chronicles 16. So I'm going to just shuffle it over. Sorry if you've already read it. Psalm 133 is another one of those songs of ascent, but it's Psalm 107 that I spent time in today. And while some will attribute it to be written possibly by David, there's an indication that, again, it's about a time when Israel has been shattered and is now being gathered back in, for he has gathered back the exiles from many lands. Like we saw with Psalm 102, there's an indication that it's prophetically talking about a time in the future rather than a historical testimony looking back. And here's the indication, it's right at the end of the psalm. The godly will see these things and will be glad, while the wicked are struck silent. Those who are wise will take all this to heart. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. So it's a bit of a time travel brain twister, but it is future tense language. So the way I read it, is that they are saying that in the future, the godly will see these things, the wise will take what he's saying now, which will be in their past, to heart, and they will see by looking at this prophecy that was recorded back in their history, a prophecy that is now coming true, that it's a sign to them that the Lord is faithful. And if this is the case, then this psalm becomes a treasured possession for them, for an exiled future generation, when they are lost and they are homeless, when they are imprisoned in iron chains of misery, when they are fools who have rebelled or they become impoverished through oppression, trouble and sorrow. The promise, the prophetic promise written way back in their history that is going to come true now when they're suffering these things is that if they cry out, Lord, help, then he will rescue them from their distress. He will lead them to safety and satisfy the hungry with good things. He will break down the prisons and heal them and bless them. Great promises, still relevant for us today. And that's the end of week 24. Thanks for a great week. I'm going to see you next time. The Chrome blog comes out each Thursday in 2022 and then lives in YouTube for eternity. If you want a reminder of new blogs each week, pop your email address on the website link below. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, it will be easier to find it in your subscription tab. See you soon.